One of these is a 25 minute print made on the Bamboo Lab X1 Carbon, which is a 3D printer that costs $1,200. The other one of these little boats here is a, well, about three hours it took to print it on the printer called the Easy 3 K9, which costs a whopping $70. So, can you guys tell the difference? Which one do you think was made on the cheap machine, albeit a whole lot more time? The Bamboo Lab X1 Carbon or X1C 3D printer is the gold standard. It's bar none the best consumer level 3D printer out there. It's so good that it's the choice of professionals even for like model making or prototyping all these tasks. That's the printer to beat. And so all of the other Chinese brands have started to make machines that look kind of like it, but none of them perform at quite the same level. That being said, it's not perfect. Go ahead and watch my review video about it to learn everything that there is. Like I partially disassemble it. I review these printers in a way that kind of nobody else does. So it's worth watching that video. And you'll see that there is, um, you know, needs which are not met by this $1,200 machine. We need some competition, don't we? Yeah, we need this to be a more diverse marketplace. So the consumer, you and me, have more choices. And to that end, I went looking for competition to this printer and I came up with this. The Easy 3 K9 Mini 3D printer for $70. <laughs> so that is 17 times less expensive. And I'm wondering, can this thing really be 17 times worse than that? Let's find out. All right, Easy 3 is the brand name here. Sounds like a Dr. Seuss name, huh? The model name is the K9. Now, this is a brand. You can go find their website and they have other printers. Some plasticky structural bits that aren't very structural. We got the 100 millimeter bed. Let's look at that. Uh, I'm seeing a thing you can pop off. It's magnetic so you can peel your prints, but man, I'm not gonna be trying to touch that very much because it's not heated, which means every little bit of oil on that bed will make a big difference. All right, the instructions might be critical. Let's save those. And that looks like the filament spool holder to me. This isn't promising. That's tiny, that's tiny. Okay, the two, in case you lose it, we've got the two USB readers and one micro SD card. And then we've got all of the, uh, the main printer body parts in a tray. Let's see, what's going on here? Yep, all in a tray. So we've got three stepper motors. Those are not NEMA 17s, goodness gracious no. And the inexpensive stepper motors which have been implemented into this machine are a key reason that it's so inexpensive. So here we have your typical NEMA 17 used for years, still many, many systems. In fact, I'm, I believe that the, um, the Bamboo Lab X1C uses this to drive all of its axes and stuff. So yeah, very, very common to see on 3D printers. This is a Pancake NEMA 17. These are each about $8 a piece. Um, this was typical for years when you needed a sort of lower profile, lighter weight application. That's what everybody turned to. And then in sort of like the last, I don't know, three years or so, um, we started to get into NEMA 14 motors. At least we see them in, um, you know, high performance, hot end extruder combinations, direct drive extruders, the things you're gonna find in your Voron printers and stuff. This is like $14 a piece. So it's basically tw twice as expensive as these. Okay, so finally you have your 28 BYJ motor and it takes a special stepper driver. If you'll notice, all of these have four wires coming out the back of them, whereas this has five wires. So um, you can get this motor and this driver package for about $2.50. That's your price if you go and buy them. I mean, without shipping. So imagine how much money they're spending if you're a producer making a machine in China. It's got to be 50 cents for these two components. It's so amazingly inexpensive, but that comes at a cost. You can see this is just sort of a stamped steel construction, little folded over tabs, that kind of thing. Whereas these are some beefy 
CNC parts. These are a bunch of uh, little flat pieces of steel. So it's ferrous, it's magnetic, and these are aluminum end caps and there's screws. Just the assembly of this is much more complicated and it should be that much more expensive. Whereas with this, they've managed to make the whole thing work with just folded metal. And it's much weaker as far as just an output shaft goes. With these motors, you can drive the, the machine straight from the the shaft there, which is on the, what is it, the, the rotor. So the rotor can directly drive the axis, the belt or whatever that's, that's causing the printer to move. But on these little tiny little anemic motors, you can't do that. They're not powerful enough, so they have to be um, geared down. And that's why you see the shaft as being off-centered. So there's a central shaft in there that's driving a gear, that's driving another gear, which is finally getting to this shaft. And they are back drivable. You can spin them, like I'm spinning that right now with my hand. But um, it's not great. And there's a bit of, you guys can see that, I'm holding the shaft perfectly still, and that's the amount of lash or backlash in them. So they have got a significant amount of play, and that means that they're not as accurate when driving axes. So we don't see these typically implemented on 3D printers just because they're not gonna be as accurate. And then this is the, the main base of the printer. So this thing is just like mini, and that's why they call it mini P or mini printer. Oh, it is it's very tiny, some shipping damage. But hey, I don't see any, any reason why I can't get this thing assembled here reasonably quickly. But because I've never done this before, it might be a little confusing. Maybe I can figure this out, let's see. Are these three identical pieces? Wow, talk about value engineering, you guys. They were able to make this whole thing happen with three identical pieces. How cool. Okay, so obviously one of them is going to slide into... Oh, no, the bed slides into this, like that. Well, the bed has to move. Huh, it's a puzzle, it's a puzzle. Huh. I better look at the instructions. Give me a minute. What is this, an instruction manual for ants? Oh my god, I need a magnifying glass to read this. All right, so the first motion axis clicks into the bed like so. I guess that's secure enough. You don't want to breathe on this thing too hard when it's printing. The second motion system here slides into the base, just like that. That feels a bit more secure than the bed. This motion axis goes here like this. The bed slides on right like so. Click, click, click. All right, the spool holder clicks into this piece just like so. There we go. That just sort of sits on the bed, or on the back of that thing. Yeah, just like that. And then you got your print head, which um, we don't want it to interfere. I don't know, coming from the underside maybe? And, oh look, that's already fallen off. Uh, I guess it's gotta come over the top? Yeah, over the top. And then down into, down into there. Come on, you can fit. There we are. All right, it's all seated. Put this thing back on there. And I've got this mini roll of white PLA, which <laughs> kind of could go on there. This is just too janky for me. God, you gotta have to like glue this on there or something. Hold that there just so. There we go. That, that'll, that'll work. <laughs> that'll print. Whoops. I ordered the wrong plug for North America. That won't work. Thankfully, it's just a 12 volt, 2 amp power supply. So I should be able to come up with some solution here. Uh, hopefully, I don't have to cut that pigtail off and splice it on or anything like that. But we'll see. It's so much flex. Once it starts printing, you don't touch it. You just leave it in the far side of the room and you don't even go near it until it's done printing. A lot of that flexing is coming from the bushings. That's just ridiculous slop. And if you're new to 3D printing, this direction is the Y, this direction is the X, and this direction is the Z. So you'll need to know that to get the correct wires hooked up. So this would be your Y, and this is Z, which is not hooked up yet. But there's the plug right there. Click. X has already been connected as well. There's no screen for interfacing with this printer. You're just going to press the play button when you're ready to get a print. So you'll load the print into the slot and then press play. But to level the bed, you'll have these four buttons there. You see those guys? One, two, three, four. And so you press one and then yeah, we'll get there. Uh, the old paper trick. Now the problem with using plastic for structural things is what's called plastic creep. And that basically just means that plastic will glacially deform when it's under pressure for long periods of time. So this will bend out of shape if it's constantly having weight pushed on it. To resist plastic deformation, the um, polymer that you use can have additives in it, such as carbon fibers. So 
Um, that would stiffen it up, but it also makes it less deformable over time. And the way to test for plastic or for carbon fiber additives or, or glass fiber, GFRP, glass fiber reinforced, is to cut it. And I don't hear any noises. And you're supposed to hear a noise when you're cutting plastic that's been uh, <laughs> treated with an additive. So this is additive free. That's just the base polymer. Let's burn the little tail there to get a whiff and see just what this smells like. Oh yeah, that's ABS. So <laughs> just cheap ABS everywhere. <clears throat> <clears throat> So I've detached the x-axis here, and I figured out that if you remove these screws, you can pop the linear motion guide rods just out of the uh, injection molded part here, and they are hollow. FFS, my god. <laughs> yeah, $65. It's definitely value engineered in every possible way. So then this part comes off, and we might be able to do something with this to try and eliminate that play, but you know, the bushings. These are, these are just way too loose. All right, I've come up with a solution to remove the lash or backlash, whatever you want to call it, out of the, uh, out of the system here. You can see there's just a very minimal amount of play uh, between the bar and the bushings now, whereas the unmodified one has a lot. So, yeah, pretty obvious how I accomplished that drilled two holes on each thing, cut a slit. Now, I did use my jank life <laughs> little rotary tool here to cut like so. And I put the cut, I'm not, I'm not gonna do it on camera because it's, yeah, it's, um, it takes skill, you guys. You gotta have a steady hand. You saw how I was holding my hands, kind of fingers, fingers there, you know, bracing and cutting in very slowly, but this width, that, you know, with the wiggle, with doing it by hand, the width that this cuts with the uh, cutoff wheel here on the rotary tool is just about perfect. For the first cut here, I actually used the hacksaw and just, again, lined it up like that until I cut through. Now, it's gonna be a little more challenging around that boss right there. But yeah, the hacksaw worked, it's just that the slit was too narrow. So it needs to be mm, more or less the width of two hacksaw blades. And in order to widen the gap, as soon as I had cut it, I spread it open, stuck this file inside there and filed the gap a little bit wider. Now this is PTFE. That's the same material as your Bowden tubes are made out of. So uh, it's pretty soft, pretty easy to work with, but you guys, you don't want to overdo it. Creep up on it, you know, make a lot of your little wire ties. Now, speaking of that, I'm using this steel wire. Uh, I think you need the strength. So go with steel, not aluminum. And yeah, that's how we're gonna get much better print quality out of this printer. It's an easy hack, but it takes some time and some fine motor skills to accomplish. If you're really hard up for tools, like you just don't have anything at your disposal, I think you could probably accomplish this using a knife, just a knife, but you would have to be very careful and very um, patient. You know, just sort of like slowly working your way in there, something like that. Um, I didn't try it, but um, I'm sure it's possible. Uh, maybe do like little back and forth cuts like this, something. I think you could accomplish it, but I'm not gonna waste the time. I've got all the tools. You can get an idea for just how wide that gap needs to be. And conveniently, there's these two grooves to accept the, I don't know, what is this, like 16th inch drill bit? So that's super easy to drill these two holes. Feed your wire through the hole. Start it by hand and finish it with the pliers. Now here's the trick. This is basically tightening up the, uh, the gap. So you can see here on this one, uh, I still have a gap that's showing. I can still get my fingernail into that gap. And if I put the rod inside of there, we can see that I've still got very free movement and a little bit of wiggle. Now it's a whole lot less than at this end. I've already greatly diminished it, which is gonna be a big improvement in your print quality, but we can get this perfect. The idea is that you just keep tightening it by like an eighth of a turn on each of these uh, little, little wire twists until it still slides reasonably free, but there's no play as far as you can observe. 
Um, so you want unimpeded movement, but as tight as you can get with un unimpeded movement. And the thing is, I should not be tightening these ones down until it's all here on the machine because there might be some width care um, considerations to also be made. Right, so snapping this all into place, it still slides, but it stays put right where it's at, wherever I slide it to. I, I still don't think that that's enough um, resistance that this, this motor won't be able to overcome that. But if I do need to, I can release some of the tension here by carefully just unwinding these maybe like an eighth of a turn or a sixteenth of a turn each. There is no play in the joint anymore, in the movement. Out here you can see we still get some movement, but that is the whole, um, the whole tower flexing at this joint. So maybe if I stuff some paper into that crack or something to really get it tight, but remember plastic creep, so if we tighten up that gap, uh, it will... <laughs> It will loosen itself, you know, it will stretch over time, basically. Plastic should not be used as a structural material. This is why 3D printed, um, 3D printers aren't great, like uh, your Vorons or, yeah, the 3D printed parts on a Prusa. Yeah, not, not great. So you want metal for structural components. But this is as good as I can get it, and now I just have to do the other two, the one for the X-axis and the Y-axis. You can see... It still moves it just fine. So it just runs out until it hits the dead end and then it knows it's at the bottom of its travel. Pretty stupid machine, but man, they really have value engineered it to not need any sensors for homing or anything like that. All right, I've got it printing the uh, the test print that came on the SD card back in there. And I'll go through the startup routine on the next print, but it's looking pretty good, you guys. I think that the quality is gonna be quite nice given our, um, efforts at eliminating the lash or backlash, whatever you want to call it. It's technically lash, but nobody ever calls it that. So backlash is the, uh, the common parlance and therefore that's what we usually uh, use to describe the wiggle. But anyway, yeah, this is looking like it's printing quite well. It's just kind of confusing as to how to get here. <laughs> so I'll show you guys, there's like a button in the back. There's a bunch of buttons up here. And well, let's look at this print first once it's finished and then I'll show you how to do that. Well, I don't know what's going on here. We'll see if this turns out to be successful, but you know, it printed this raft and it did great. And now it seems to be sort of peeling up off the raft. Th those layer lines just don't look right to me. So, dang, and this is the this is the print that they sent with the printer. I didn't even set up this G-code. So you think the guys who made the, uh, who made the machine could send a successful print for it. <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought was gonna happen. I've walked away for, I don't know, half an hour and came back to this. So this is upside down. That means that the layers which are up would be the first layers that we're printing. And they just were not sticking to each other, nor were they sticking down to the raft, which was perfect. Like that is a flawless raft. It's fantastic. So I did a really good job lay, uh, leveling the bed and there's really no reason for this. Uh, one thing promising that I am seeing is the, the part of the print that did work. Those layers look pretty good, pretty consistent. And considering that this is a non-heated bed, that was stuck down pretty good. Three cheers for the raft. So looking at this motion rod, I'm noticing that the lines on it seem to be going around this way. Like it was turned on a lathe almost, and I can feel the grooves with my fingernail. I'm sure you guys can hear that, so we need to polish that up. To that end, I've got this 500 grit wet dry silicone carbide sandpaper, and I'm sanding it only along the length of it, not, not around. All right, I've polished my rod, <laughs> the right one anyway. Can you guys see the difference in the sheen of it? It just looks shinier. See, it catches the light better. So yeah, definitely I can feel the smoothness and look at my black stained hand with all the metal dust on it. Kind of a non-negotiable thing, an absolute thing that needs to be done to tune up this machine. Things are looking a lot better on this print. Looks like it's stuck down to the raft. The test print is done. Let's see how it pops off the raft. Not too bad. Good little, kind of like a, um, a vase mode, although it was double walled. Those, um, those layer lines look pretty good, you guys. Yeah, polishing the rods, all it needed to, uh, to get success. Pretty cool. Here on the side of the printer, we've got this little switch down here. And if we can get it to show in the light, it says feed retract. So pulling the switch towards the front should allow the filament to come back out of the head here. Okay, so let's feed it right here. So we're, we're going forward and it's blinking because it's heating up. 
now it is feeding and I can feel the uh, filament coming out and if we see it here in a second yeah see this it is dropping dropping filament so that's good right okay let's switch the direction on the switch nothing let's try it in the middle so the switch is not not feeding and not retracting and now we will retract blinking Oh, something's happening. Oh, it's feeding. It's supposed to be retracting. The switch is pulled towards me. I guess I'm just gonna have to resort to some shenanigans, just uh, cut it off flush basically, and then feed it on out until it runs out and then stick the new filament in there. Oh, now it's coming back out. How interesting. So if you leave it on retract, it will feed out for a minute until it spits it back at you. Okay, interesting, good to know. Right, so I just loaded the original SD card that came with the printer. I was trying to use my own SD card. Maybe it's not formatted in the correct. I formatted that one in FAT, and this is formatted in FAT32. I don't know. Anyway, you can see that red light back in there blinking, and the green light on the play button is also blinking, so I think that means that it's heating up. Yep, that's getting nice and hot. Oof. Getting ready to go. I think it'll start printing here in a second. Oh no, I definitely didn't label the bed correctly. All right, I gotta get it closer. Let's try that again. And so begins the three hour Benchy. You can see I print pretty close to the bed for the first layer, but because it's building a raft and because the the prints pop off this pretty, pretty easily. So you have to print with a raft, I guess. Um, it's kind of hard to level this bed. Uh, I'm gonna go to bed. That's right, I'm gonna be crazy and I'm gonna trust this $69 machine to not catch on fire while I'm sleeping. <laughs> Keep your fingers crossed for me. Living dangerous. The filament spool holder fell off the back. I'm gonna have to hot glue this in place or something like that. That is just, that's the worst part of this printer. Right, so in the harsh lighting from the side here, we can see all the layer lines and we can see the seam right there where my thumbnail is. Um, not too bad, you guys. I'm not noticing any like salmon skinning or uh, other artifacts that usually happen over the bow of a Benchy. So that's normally where we get all the problems. You can even see the uh, the logo peeled off the raft reasonably well. There's one more strand of the raft right there at my thumbnail. I could try to peel that off, but not that important to me. Now we are getting this like layer shift right here through the bow, doesn't look too good. And then we're seeing sort of a sparseness right here. Like it looked uh, like we had extruder issues. Let's try this again, but let's take care of that holder first. The true culprit reveals itself. Look at, I got a tangle. I have never had one of these, you guys, during a print. <laughs> That's the first time ever. So there we go. That's why. That's why we had the, the issues on this bench here. Let's print another one. Let's just take care of that right here by pulling this loop off the printer. And Bob's your uncle. We will now be able to print successfully. But not before hot gluing the... Uh, the filament spool holder here to the back. Yeah, I'll just put some hot glue here in the in the corner, swish it in there, and that ought to do the trick. And try again. The red light comes on behind the button. You can kind of see it back in there. And then the button will start blinking and then it'll start printing. All right, three more hours, let's go. While I'm waiting for this one to finish printing, I'm gonna print this one here on the Bamboo Lab X1C. Apparently 24 minutes is the time. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, yeah, three hours versus 24 minutes. That's uh, six times faster, and that's a lot. So compare the speed here on the Bamboo Labs X1C versus what's happening here. And uh, yeah, um, that's what you get for $1,500 more or something crazy like that. It's a lot of money to spend, but it's a lot faster. And it's done. Let's have a look at it. This is the Bamboo Lab X1C version let's pop this off and then put a mark on it so we know which one's which boop ct 3 dxyz now this is going to be a little bit smoother because it printed on that smooth bamboo lab sheet whereas this printed on a raft but hey that's the writing is still visible you guys there's not much of a difference we got this like layer shifty looking thing here there's one that's similar there the rest of the bow looks just about the same um Oh look, there's some little goobers. That could just be an artifact of the of the um, the slicer. This was sliced in Kira, and also you can see the the cross patterns of the support material inside there. 
coming through. Whereas that's not showing here. So this is just going to be slicer settings mostly for that. But the coolant, like like how good the part cooling is, you guys, it's I can't tell a difference. I can't see any difference. This one looks a little bit more droopy, and that is the the, tre the cheap printer here. So just barely, ever so more droopy. I mean, you guys, <laughs> I think I think I just won the competition that I didn't even know I was entered in, and I challenge anybody to do it cheaper. So this is the best Benchy for the least money. You have to show the receipt that you bought the printer retail and show all the modifications you did. So that's a $70 Benchy right there. Do it better for cheaper, that's the challenge. As it turns out, I just didn't have the filament arm seated all the way, so it's really quite on there now. Uh, but you can see the, the hot glue came off and uh, you just really gotta click that into place and then it, it should stay affixed. It's funny, I doubted the attachment mechanism and thought that was the problem, but that's what you get when, you, when you're buying something so cheap from China and anything could be you know, a corner that was cut and something could be wrong with it. <laughs> you just tend to, to doubt every little, every little problem. You think it's the problem of the machine and not the problem of the operator. But that's not the case. They actually did a pretty good job with everything. All right, now we've got a new challenge. You see the, the bed here measures 120 millimeters across. That would be so awesome if we could use that entire space. That's a lot more than 100 millimeters. The thing is that these axes are limited at the ends by these parts right here that I'm touching, this part of the geometry. So if I slide this down here, we can see it's colliding right there with the um, with the bushing. And the same on the other side, of course. But if we drop this to the bed and get a look, we can see that it's not quite to the end, so we can give ourselves a little bit more space by carving away at this, um, this black plastic here. And on this end, we can get ourselves, there's like 18 millimeters worth of extra room there on the bed. You can see right here, this is an unmodified movement axis module or MAM for short. <laughs> so what we're gonna do is trim this part that my thumbnail is touching. You can see that I have modified all three axes. You can see the hot glue. So that I now have 110 millimeters of physical travel on the machine. Unfortunately, I'm not gonna go into the details about how I accomplished that because it doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is the firmware on the control board has a software end stop limit so it will not let it go farther than 100 millimeters. It's a silly thing for them to have done. They're using brute force to home the machine so they're just sort of colliding to the end of the travel for homing. So why they would put software limits on the travel is kind of beyond me and it's frustrating. I wrote them an email asking for the firmware so I can modify it or asking them if they would modify it. Of course, I got no response. So realistically, we're stuck with 100 millimeters of travel in all dimensions, which kind of sucks. But, you know, there's always the option if you want to go crazy of putting a new custom firmware onto the control board. I know somebody has done a Marlin install. I don't know about a Clipper install. And to me, it's just not worth it. You know, it wasn't too hard to modify the... Um, the bushings so that we got no play and this extended travel modification also wasn't too tough but based on prior experience you're going to sink days of your time into trying to get a new firmware running on that control board just accept the printer for what it is 100 millimeters is your max travel filament loading and unloading on this machine sucks this is the worst like it actually is the worst that i've ever had on any machine so right now i've got it trying to load I've just, I've got the switch back here slid all the way to the rear, which is the load position, and nothing's coming out. This is blinking, so I have to put this back to the middle position, that's nothing, and I have to unplug it, because there's no power switch on the machine, so that's how you turn it on and off, by unplugging it. Now that it's plugged back in, to unload it, I should just be able to slide the switch to the forward, that's the un-retract position there, and it should just pull that filament right on out of there. And we saw a minute ago that what it first does is feed it. So it should be when that light stops blinking, the nozzle is up to temperature and it should start feeding. And that's what we'll feel. All right, I can feel it feeding. It is indeed feeding. Now, when it starts to retract, maybe if I help it, okay, it's still feeding. I can still feed it, feed it, feel it feeding. And I guess it's just purging so that it can retract more easily. It doesn't get stuck down in there somehow. Okay, we're still, Okay, now it's coming back out. If I help it, I'm helping it. Pulling it hard, because it got stuck a minute ago and it couldn't retract all by itself. If I help it, oh, will we get there? Will we get there? I'm helping it. 
something's happening. Oh, yeah, let go, finally let go. Look at that long tail, oh man. <laughs> oh man, this is what you get when you don't have a hot end cooling fan. So all they've got is this part cooling fan, which is um, not cooling here. So we do not have a cold end as it's called. There's not a good separation between the melt zone and where the filament is coming in. That has to be the worst part cooling that I have ever seen. It doesn't even take all of the uh, all of the fan. Half the fan air is just blowing on the little mini stepper motor and none of the fan air is going to the cold end of the uh, of the, the whatever the hot end. <laughs> yeah well we've got this plate here so I guess they're thinking of that whole plate as acting like the cold end. So they are cooling the stepper, which is a heat sink for the plate, which is kind of the cold end. So kinda? And so we have PTFE tubing, and that's the, the heat break right there. That's the PTFE tubing is the heat break itself. So you have this clamp right here holding the what would just normally be the nozzle on most printers, and the nozzle is gonna have some sort of a wrap of nitrile or I'm sorry, nichrome wire and a thermistor in there. So that's that's a very as basic hot as you can possibly come up with. And once again, you have one of these um, micro stepper motors that, yeah, so it sucks. And not only that, the PTFE tubing coming out of the top here um, doesn't come out far enough so that the filament here, which is feeding over the top, is going to saw because it's going to be constantly going over the top of this wire bundle, which is why I've added this tape here. But a better solution would be to have a longer section of PTFE tubing, which is why I've got this ready to go. So let's see, it looks like I can just pull this to the side and then pull it out. Yep, that, that works. Now you can see there's this little uh, one-way kind of washer looking thing that won't allow it to kind of retract. Replace that with a longer length of tubing if you have it or go buy it. But here's the kicker, you guys. You have to make sure that this stuff is exactly four millimeters in diameter. I believe this will measure 4.1, uh, 4.5, .1, but not 4.2. So this stuff here measures 3.95 and I tried some 4.2 two or 4.1 millimeter stuff and it didn't work. So definitely your OD, it's a tight fit right there. So get that to work. And then you've got this one way washer here that you have to slide back off the end and reinstall that as well. And the idea of this one way washer is that it seats up against that black plastic so that cannot pull out. Yeah, that'll do the job. There we go. This might help with loading and unloading as well. We'll have to see. So the protective masking tape can come off and that should do the job just fine. And I'll reinstall this flip up shield because we need to cover this side of the air vent, air duct for the, for the fan. Pulling this protective plate off the bottom here, we can see the uh, chip AT32F, yeah, 32 bit. And these stepper motor drivers are the next thing that I'm curious about. Those have four wires going to them. 4988 stepper motor drivers. So those should be standard stepper motor wires that will run any stepper motor. So the best part about this whole printer is the board, which is completely upgradable. You could change up all the steppers. There's a heated bed, which is not being utilized. That's awesome. I don't know why they made this stupid button back here be the homing button. That should be on and off. You should be able to just turn the machine on while leaving it plugged in. Looks like there's an expansion slot for something. Yeah, there's um, there's some possibility in this board. Precariously looking at the backside of this control board gives us nothing. There's this um, QR code, which is kind of embedded into the circuit board, into the PCB, but that just gives us the serial number. So there's no brand name on here that I can read. That ET4000 is about the only clue we get. My guess is this is the control board that Easy 3 makes for all of their printers. They just have a standard control board. Right, so I already showed you guys how you can just put your print, and that's a single print. You can't have multiple print files on the root folder. You can have a, a subfolder, like print files to be printed later on, but at your computer, you have to load a single file onto this TransFlash or SD card and then stick that in the machine, press play. When you wanna put another print on there, you have to go change it out on your computer, stick it in there and press play. Now, because I have this machine leveled and ready to go, I just press play and it will work. 
but uh, to get it set up, it's a little bit of a procedure. So let's go over that right now. First of all, I already told you guys, in order to turn the machine on and off, you have to unplug it. There is no power switch. Where the power switch would normally be here on the back is the home button. See the little home icon? And that's pretty much useless as I've found it. You're not gonna need to do anything about that because your print file from the slicer software will have a, a homing. So it will automatically home at the beginning of every print. And also when you press the number one button here, because we're going to level the, the four corners here in a second. So there's the number one button. And that, when you press that, the first thing it does is homes the machine. So that button on the back is really quite useless. Of course, we already covered the, um, the switch here for, um, you know, getting the extruder fed and primed and loaded and everything. But let's just go over the, um, the leveling procedure. So you press that button there, it does the homing algorithm. And what it's doing is just running the stepper motors physically to the end stop to where it can't move anymore, just start grinding them. <laughs> and then it figures, hey, good enough. Uh, I don't think there's a feedback. Um, but yeah, I don't need, I think it's just physically letting them grind themselves to a stop. And you can see that I can barely get that paper under there. And it is quite tight, you guys. A lot tighter than I would do a normal machine with a more precise uh, bed level, you know, that didn't have this perforated bed. So yeah, even though it's magnetic and it comes off, the, the plastic that you're printing onto has all these little holes punched in it. And you can see they've been filled in from the prior prints with leftover PLA. And what that means is you can't use your normal bed scraping tools to really get the bed perfectly clean because those holes are filled and this is just gonna slice the print right off at the holes. All right, let's go to measuring point number two. I like to put the paper uh, down so that it lowers onto it and it's pinched and I can feel that is too loose. I have too much friction free movement there so I'm going to spin the knob down, which is going to make the bed go up. It's going to loosen things, and yeah, that's tight enough. I like it. It's good. Let's check point three. One, two, three. Pretty good. And four. Yep, I like it. So that is calibrated. All right, I have printed this test print to illustrate your reasonable print volume on this machine. It's about the size of my fist in cubic format. <laughs> so it's 90 millimeters in all dimensions here, and it looks like we could get an extra 10 millimeters from the Z direction. So you could easily get 100 millimeters tall, but 90 millimeters in the X and the Y is what you can reasonably achieve. And the reason for that is because you need to leave um, sort of a, a boundary of, what is it, five millimeters on both sides for the raft. Now I was able to print this. We're, we're seeing some elephant's footing if you guys can look there, it's a little thicker at the bottom. So you want the raft in order to not get elephant's footing with this just super flexible, uh, squishable bed. That's just so inaccurate. You need to start with an elephant or with a raft, which means that you're going to burn, I don't know, like five millimeters. Maybe you could get that down to like two millimeters space. And in Kira, which is what this printer comes with the, uh, you know, the, the setup software for Kira. So yeah, you're probably going to stick with Kira on this and that's going to have an automatic buffer there. So yeah, 90 millimeters, reasonably speaking. You can you can tweak things and get more, but yeah, just think of 90 millimeters by 100 millimeters tall, what you're going to get. Now, now let's treat this as a test print and measure it, and it is indeed 90 millimeters. Quite quite accurate that direction, quite accurate in this direction. It looks it looks good, you guys. The um the axes are the the steps per millimeter in the stepper motors and the firmware is set up quite well. Pulling the magnetic bed off the uh, the main bed here has detached that print. Uh, let's hope that it stays reasonably dimensionally secure to where it was when it was printing, and we'll just give this a measure. 129. 129. So actually, this machine is printing reasonably accurate, uh, you know, dimensionally accurate prints. That's pretty cool. I was expecting the lash or backlash. Uh, to be more substantial of a problem. Now they mitigated that by um, using the smallest possible pulleys to drive the you know GT2 timing belts here. But um, wow, that is, I'm really kind of impressed. All right, I developed this little backlash test. You can see it switches directions right there at that, on that wall on the left and just uh, goes back the other direction. So 
theoretically what would happen because the inner and the outer wall are going in opposite um, rotations. So one is clockwise, one is counterclockwise. Therefore, the lash error should be double because, you know, relative to each other, it should be twice the lash. So we should really not see any alignment between the inner and outer walls if there is any lash in this machine. And you know what, guys? It appears to be functioning just fine, which just blows my mind. How? How on earth are they getting no backlash or lash out of these stepper motors? They must have sourced some really high quality gear train components or something. Right there is the seam. You can see it where it switched directions and I don't see any separation between the walls anywhere. Measuring the diagonal on the square here, we're getting 27.98 in that dimension, 27.99 in that direction. So it is perfect, you guys. I'm, I'm flabbergasted. How, how, how are they doing this with these horribly inexpensive stepper motors? Let's take this stepper motor out of the machine and maybe even disassemble it just to see what's going on. By the way, there's a screw that you can install into the drive axis, which stiffens things up. I forgot to mention that. And it's been a couple of minutes since I completed this print, but the stepper motor is still quite toasty. <laughs> so uh, those things must get really warm during uh, extended print times. You guys see that? That's all the backlash. That's all there is. It's tiny. But even that should lead to a significant difference in the printing. So uh, there's uh, just something magical happening in this motion system that's accounting for this. You see that belt is being pulled from this surface right here. And if you look, as I wiggle that thing, we're getting a little movement. We should be having at least a half a millimeter of movement. And it's possible that's what's happening right there. It doesn't quite look like those two legs are lined up. See the gap? See the seam right there? It doesn't quite look like those two seams line up. So this one was coming from this direction and this one was coming from that direction. Um. Yeah, but if that's all the inaccuracy, this is still going to make fully viable engineered components. Uh, you know, plastic expanding and contracting gives you more of a problem than that. So for functional prints, this machine is totally viable. In order to take a look at the gear train in here, I'm going to have to figure out a way to unbend these little stakes. These little moments where the, where the sheet metal got bent over to retain this cap onto this shell. All right, I think I figured out why these steppers are performing so much better than I expected. Most of the gears in the gearbox are metal. You can see that this magnetic screwdriver tip is actually sti sticking to them. And if I can do it right, there you go. See, it pulls, it even pulls that out of the, out of the whole container there. The two plastic gears are the one that's directly attached to the drive shaft from the stepper motor itself. And then the second gear, which gets driven. So those are going to have the least amount of torque on them. They're the least likely to strip out. So it's possible that they mostly did this metal gear thing just to avoid uh, plastic gears getting damaged. But um, yeah, maybe it also has to do with the backlash. I really don't know. Um, it would be interesting to talk to a production engineer who knows the difference between this and the less expensive versions of these 28 BYJ motors. And hey, how do you determine which one's which. Like if I wanted to do a project with the really high quality ones, how would I source those? It's a mystery. All right, let's see if I can get this thing back together and get those tabs restaked back into place. By the way, E3D kind of sucks. A few years ago, I reviewed the E3D Tool Changer and their 28 BYJ being used on the actual locking mechanism that holds the tools. Once you change them, it holds the tools to the print head, to the moving carriage. And it did not have the threaded hole to retain the little gear mechanism on it. Instead, they held a super glue. That's actually the official instructions how to super glue the gear onto the motor. So this little $70 craptacular printer coming from China has a higher quality solution than that which E3D, known for quality, could produce. Well, because this machine is so surprisingly accurate, I've decided to do a test print with the most challenging and functional 3D print that I've personally designed, which YouTube will allow me to show to you guys. And that is gonna be a carabiner. It's gonna take another, I don't know, three hours or so to complete that print. But in the meantime, let's talk about this um, cheap stepper motor, 28BYJ. So these are the really inexpensive ones. They're like $2 a piece that I paid for these. 
and the shaft seems to have about the same amount of lash as the motor that I took apart from the printer itself. So I wanted to dive into that and see what's going on there. Taking this one apart, we can see the gear train is entirely made of plastic gears. So these are definitely higher quality, and yet the lash isn't any better. So that leads me to believe that the control board and the firmware, more importantly on the control board, is compensating for that lash. So it's a known quantity and the firmware is just predicting it before it happens, taking up that, that slop, winding up more of the belt to compensate for the, you know, the, the slop that would be in there during a movement change. Right, so I've disassembled this thing a bit further and we can start to see what's going on. First of all, I'm told that you can simply scratch the center trace off right here. Give it a good scratch so that that wire no longer connects basically. Then you can cut the red wire out of the mix, just remove it from the loom, and you can drive these stepper motors from a typical um, stepper motor driver. Which is interesting because we have five wires on this machine going to Polu A4988 stepper motor drivers, and yet they didn't do this, apparently. Now, I didn't fully disassemble that stepper motor, so maybe something else is going on inside there, but that's still pretty interesting to me. And with this view, we can understand why these stepper motors are just so incredibly inexpensive to produce. They, they're kind of a stroke of genius, really, you guys. Whoever thought of this design is very intelligent as far as value engineering goes. Basically, the spikes here, which aim towards the center, are bent down, and so this whole plate would be like the North Pole. And so when those spikes are down there, that's the, the North Pole. And then over here, we have a plate which bends up, and those are gonna be the South Pole. So every other, so where the gap is there, that's the South Pole, North, South, North, South. And that's how we're able to get steps right here. So I've taken the rotor and this top plate out of the motor, and we can see the little tangs that I was talking about. So this whole plate would be polarized North, and that means that these tangs, as they're bent down, would also be North. And then the next plate, that's sticking up those tangs would be polarized south. And if I reinstall everything, I can actually spin this by hand and feel the cogging. So I can feel the permanent magnet here on the rotor kind of indexing against north-south, north-south um, little tangs that are bent down in there. So very, very simple design. And of course the copper coils can be seen from the sides and from the top through the translucent plastic here. And those are the electromagnets that you know, are controllable via electronic signals coming from the control board, which interface with the permanent magnet here on the rotor. So these super inexpensive stepper motors are a massive part of the reason that this printer is so affordable. And it begs the question, if these guys can compensate for the backlash or lash in firmware, and it totally works, why don't we see these stepper motors on all of the inexpensive machines coming from China? And the answer is because there's no free ride. There's no such thing as a free lunch and there's always a trade-off. So in order to get the required amount of torque from these tiny little motors, they're having to be geared down. There, you saw the three gears in this. And so for every rotation of the um, output shaft here, the stator, or I'm sorry, the rotor inside there is gonna have to spin a, a ton of times. Something like, you know, a hundred times or something like that to get a single rotation. And that just makes the printer print very slowly. So these motors are the reason the thing is inexpensive, but these motors are also the reason that it prints at this snail's pace. Let's talk about printing with a full roll of filament on this inexpensive tiny machine. You can see I've got this Sunlu PLA Plus. I'm using two Sunlu boxes with a long screwdriver between them pushed through the hole on the box just to ensure that this, you know, the filament's not gonna walk itself off the boxes here. And it's working. It would be nice if this thing came with an actual filament stand that wasn't made for just this, you know, tiny little roll of filament like that. This thing is pretty much a farce as far as I'm concerned. It does work, I guess, with the roll of filament that came with the printer. I didn't even bother to open this. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, maybe that would hang on there, but because it's not on an actual spool, you're likely to get tangles and have problems with your first couple of prints. The Y-axis for the bed here just has way too much movement. Look at look at that gap forming there. It can go up, it can go down, it can go every which way. And I've got the screw installed here to try to keep it a bit more rigid, but um, what we're gonna do is plastic weld. I don't know, I think this is stable enough here. So we're just gonna melt this seam together 
with a soldering iron. We'll literally, you could use some hot glue if you wanted to. Do that, just sort of smooth and blend the, uh, the two pieces together. Yeah, I'm just gonna spot weld it out here at the ends where the, um, the most forces are able to be sort of resisted. This is stiffness comes from what's called the outer fiber distance. So you want to um, weld things together at the extents. In the middle, doesn't help much. You don't get much leverage for your welds to keep things stiff. All right, this folder is the micro SD card that came with the printer. You can see I've got my smooth carabiner file there and all of my old print files are in this hide me folder so that if I want to you know, replace them, I can do something like this. Uh, control X and Control V. And now I'm, if I stick this into the printer, it would be printing, printing the Benji again. If you are new to 3D printing and you need to learn how to use the machine, this folder right here, manual, software, and videos is the place to go. So we have PDFs that teach you what you need. We have printer manual and video with actual videos teaching you how to do it in case you're a visual learner as they say. But this folder right here, Slicer Software Video Manual is the most important and buried in all of the folders at the very bottom of this directory tree is this k9.3mf file, which is what you will drag and drop or just import into Kira and it will automatically set up Kira for this machine. So you can see I've imported the geometry into Kira. It's giving a representation of it on the bed where it's gonna sit. Those grayed out bars on the edges are the um, unprintable area. You're not allowed to print into those because it wants to print the raft into that area. Here in Kira, we've got this build plate adhesion and I've got it selected to raft. And then you can click these little sliders right there and you can add extra raft settings. The key that I found, which was not set up correctly from their Kira profile, is you want to make the base raft layer thickness to be 0.4 millimeters. It's really tall. It's as tall as the nozzle is wide. And the reason you want to do that is you want to, in that first layer, you want to make up for as much discrepancy in the bed as you can. The slicer software, Kira, says that this print is going to take three hours and 28 minutes to print. Let's see how accurate the Kira estimate is. It's been four hours and 42 minutes that this thing has been printing. Looks like the top is done. Even though I gave it a 15% overlap between the top surface and the walls, we're still getting some separation there. We got separation pretty badly up in there too. Meanwhile, the print on the X1 Carbon, the X1C, proceeded without incident. I can see the gap there on this side and on this side, and in fact, without even putting any real pressure, yeah, it's instantly separated. There was, It was never bonded. I never needed to do anything funky to get it to, to separate. And then you can bend it in like so and install the nut, which just threads right on without incident here on the Bamboo Lab print. Look at it, it just spins on. It's like loosely threaded. So that is the sort of golden standard, how things should be. The, um, the top here has no separation between the wall and the top skin. And over here, we're doing fine as well. Five hours, 10 minutes, and 45 seconds is what it took to complete this print. Let's see how good the quality is now that I adjusted those settings. Now, it's worth noting that some of the quality here could have been happening because of Bamboo Lab Studio, which is a pretty good slicer. Kira, also pretty good, but like, I don't know what's going on with that. There's like a 50-50 chance in my mind that this could be a Kira setting. Although I did have the skin overlapping the walls by 18%, really should have caught and not been peeled back from the edges. So something tells me this has to do with the retraction on the machine. So probably, reasonably speaking, this is as good as it gets for this little machine. Let's see if we can get this raft off. No, <laughs> it's not coming off. It's the same as this one. Well, giving the bed more precisely calibrated to the height with the extruder and also increasing the air gap distance between the raft and the part has seemed to make no difference whatsoever. Literally, um, getting the same adhesion in the same spots between the raft and the part where I just cannot separate them. You can see down here at the bottom, I can't get the raft off of either of these prints. Now, it is telling though that this did break apart a little bit easier right here. 
just a little bit. So you can see I'm sort of flexing it. So we got the little zigzag with the with the white line there. And if I push really hard, yeah, it'll come apart. So that is still viable. Now that nut also doesn't look great. There's that separation there happening. And internally, that's where the threads end and it's just sort of a smooth wall. So that is right about there, which is right there. So, hmm, I could probably mitigate that somehow, like printing the nut separately, the way that I did for this print. <laughs> so, all right, I'm gonna give this printer every chance in the world to make a print as good as this. I have an idea that might perform miracles. Looking at these prints on the edge like this, I'm not seeing much of a difference with the, what would be elephant's footing. This one worked perfectly on the Bamboo Lab Books on Carbon. So what I think is going on is that this nozzle is just too hot. Now I had to set it at 220, 210 degrees, something like that. It's pretty hot for PLA. But I had to set it there because we weren't getting good feeding. You heard the stepper motor skipping earlier in the video when it was trying to extrude filament. So here's my plan. This raft is just about done printing and it's about to start laying down the actual print on top of the raft. So right when this finishes, pause. Hasn't quite started printing yet. Pause it just in the nick of time there. And of course, of course, this printer, man, of course. I thought I was gonna use some glue stick all across the print there, but it's not really possible to get up under there with glue stick. So I guess I'm gonna use some nanopolymer adhesive instead. I know the saying is never attribute to malice that which can be explained by stupidity, but they did so much right with this printer. Why on earth would this be the pause position? Blocking the print entirely, making it so you cannot get to the bed in the worst possible manner. Now, while I was applying that glue, we got this much dribble out of the nozzle, which is significant. That means this is definitely not retracting quickly enough. Surprise, surprise, that little stepper motor can't move fast enough. Retractions are supposed to happen rather quickly, otherwise, the pressure that's built up in the melt zone pushes the filament out of the nozzle tip, which is not what you want. So now we're gonna have to print this long. So that is a good, what, inch or two here almost worth of filament. And it's gonna have to dribble that for an inch or two before it even starts to print. So it's gonna be printing a line down to here, starting up there, and then it'll be about there when it starts to print. So we will be missing a little bit of our print. And on other printers, there's normally like a lever that you can squeeze and you can manually push some filament through to sort of cheat it and get it ready, get it primed, but not here, not with this printer. All right, guys, like four more hours and see if we get a better print than these two. So that is gonna be a failed print. Why did this printer just suddenly quit in the middle of a print? Strange. But all is not completely lost because we can still use this opportunity to see if my glue on top of the raft technique has any promise whatsoever. And oh my God, does it ever. Wow, you guys, that just came right off. Nothing like all of the other prints. Look at this, this is fantastic. Man, I wish this had been a successful print. Look at how great that looks. This looks almost as good as the, uh, the Bamboo Lab X1C. Let's see what happens if I do this. Yeah, it comes right apart. Now it is a little tiny bit stuck together on the first or second layer, so maybe I need to lift the, uh, what you call it, the air gap there. And we do have a little bit remaining of the, um, the raft right there. Nothing that can't be sort of brute forced off with the knife here. Wow, you guys, I wish this had been a successful print. So that failure to print just now is not really the fault of the printer, not really. I mean, for $70, did you expect it to have some sort of like surge protection built into it and print resume on power loss? The reason that it happened is that I live out in the country and the power situation out here in my pole barn is pretty eh, less than ideal, let's put it that way. And in case you can't tell, we're having a thunderstorm. I can hear the thunder rumbling in the background. So uh, there was a power spike. I noticed the lights kind of dim in the room here. So yeah, that's what stress tested the printer and it just lost power for a quick second and stopped printing. But if you live somewhere with reliable power, like pretty much any major metropolitan area anywhere in the developed world, I doubt you will ever experience this problem. Let's wrap up this video with some final thoughts. And first of all, I could spend another five hours and 10 minutes to print a complete carabiner that rivals the quality of the one off of the Bamboo Lab X1C. But we already know what it's gonna look like. 
The top layer is going to have that wall separation where the wall doesn't quite meet up with the top layers in a couple of spots. And we know that the bottom is going to look just gorgeous because we can paint the raft with some glue right in the middle of the print. I went into this review expecting to make fun of this printer but try to work with it. And <laughs> that it worked out this well is a total surprise to me. And so I think I'm going to call this video like the most impressive printer I've ever reviewed because I am the most impressed because my expectations were just so low and this delivered so high compared to what I was expecting. I don't think that there's a better platform to learn on than this one. Start cheap. You don't care if you break it. Well, I mean, you do care, but you know, it's not that big of a risk. And um, the fact that this one fails and lets you down and trying to figure out where it's feeling and where you're feeling, you know, that's how you go through the steps to really learn 3D printing. So I think that anybody in the year 2024 who's getting into 3D printing and they just want a platform that they know exists out there and it's constantly at a good price point, this is the one to get. $70, phenomenally low cost. It should be, um, you know, almost like a standard purchase for every, what is it, like industrial design student or mechanical engineering student. Um, it's cheaper than a textbook, you guys. Phenomenal bargain. But it's still overpriced. Yes, I'm going to say it. It's overpriced. This should be $40. I don't know why they're charging $70, because they can get away with it. I'm looking at the bill of materials here, and the only thing that makes me start to eh, second guess myself and think, oh, maybe it should be $70, is that control board. Um, yeah. So speaking of a control board, man, I wish they'd open source that so I could fix these problems. I could fix the, you know, when you pause the print by pressing the play button, it pulls the print um, all the way to the front so that you can access it so you can put glue stick on it. By the way, if you do want to put glue stick on your, um, what is it, your raft, what you can do is mix a little glue stick with some rubbing alcohol on like a plate or something and then use a paintbrush or I don't know, like a piece of paper towel or something to paint that new mixture, that thin mixture onto the raft. So that, that technique clearly works. Like this is just a really gorgeous bottom layer. So definitely a winner there. And yeah, if you use it, you can use this cheap little machine to get almost the same quality as you're getting out of a $1,200 machine, which is just mind blowing. So yes, it's cheap, but it's small. This uh, is not quite big enough. A lot of the parts that I printed were this size, that's true. Especially for modifying 3D printers, when, I, when that was like my hobby, when, when there weren't, when this printer wasn't on the market and I had to fix all the printers that were out there to get them to really be fully functional, I was 3D printing parts for them and they would fall in this envelope. But many of the things that I wanna do outside of 3D printing are bigger than this. So it's just, it's not viable. And there's a Troncy machine, Tron XY, that I just got for $99 off of AliExpress. By the way, that's where I bought this one too. So I'm not gonna provide a purchase link. This is not a sponsored video. I paid for this thing with my own money. So go to AliExpress and you know look for the Easy 3 K9. We need to retire the Ender 3 from our collective consciousness as the beginner's printer. It was a figment of a certain moment in time and I was one of the first people to jump on that bandwagon and just be like, rah rah, Ender 3 is fantastic. But we have surpassed it in every way. Even the cheap printers are better than the Ender 3, and the only reason they're still making that printer in its original form is because people keep buying it because we can't escape that momentum of the ideology that that's the printer you should get. It's not anymore. And so I do think that this Troncy I'm about to review is better, but this platform here, especially in the coming years when it drops in price, is a total winner. If you do the modification, you know, the little wire ties to take up that slop in the bushings. All right, yeah, I think I've said everything there is to say. It's a fantastic printer, good, great bargain, great learning aid. There it is. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great day. See you in the next video. Bye. I'm the YouTube algorithm. You should subscribe to Design Prototype Test, ring the all bell and become a fiscal supporter by clicking on the links. As your benevolent overlord I'm telling you that it will make your life better. Rather than allowing me to keep force feeding you mass audience, vacuous content, you'll actually be shown the interesting stuff that most people miss.